So, one starts with G connected, semi simple, and <clears throat> let me also assume that simply connected. Semi simple real algebraic group. Or I should <coughs> no, I should say connected, I should say G identity component of a connected semi simple real algebraic group. <coughs> So that such that G C, the complex algebra group is uh, simply connected. That's the assumption. <coughs> and gamma in G, an irreducible lattice. This means the following. If uh, <coughs> the projection, that is, the projection of uh, gamma on any simple component, or rather, any real simple quotient. G may be a given name H of G is dense in H. So, pass the quotient by any normal subgroup, that is, the quotient is simple, real simple, then it must be dense there. That is the condition. It is the projection PH gamma dense. Then you call the lattice irreducible. So the Margulis theorem of super rigidity says the following <coughs> G gamma as above suppose rho gamma G L and K, K the local field is any linear representation such that any irreducible linear representation. It is not necessary. Anyway, such that <coughs> rho of G has semi simple Zersky closure. In fact, so it is not really necessary. Yes. So any linear representation such that rho G, rho gamma, take the Zersky closure in the complex algebra group, that must be. Semi simple. If this condition is satisfied, then rho, then the gamma admits a subgroup of finite index gamma prime such that rho, uh, sorry. There is one more condition which I forgot, all important condition. Rho gamma is non compact, non has non compact, closure is non compact, and the closure 
a programmer in the in G sorry in GL and K in the host dog topology. is non compact then there exists gamma prime and gamma with a finite index with gamma by gamma prime finite such that rho Restricted to gamma prime extends to a <coughs> continuous, hence to an algebraic representation of GC GLN K. In particular, K is Archimedean. and see its algebraic quotient. K is either R or C contained in C. <coughs> so, I mean you can talk of this being an algebraic representation only in only if K is R or C, otherwise you cannot talk about that. Okay, so <coughs> So, in particular, this means it means this means if K is non Archimedean, rho gamma is necessarily contained in a compact group. I could actually said here instead of uh, since I want to my code a continuous representation of G in J L and K that would automatically mean it is algebraic because if K is uh, that would automatically mean all this K is uh, uh, <coughs> non Archimedean there is no continuous homomorphism it is necessarily trivial that is that would be the conclusion. I mean so K cannot be non Archimedean. If, these conditions are satisfied, K cannot, even if I just say continuous, I do not have to say algebraic here, it can be replaced by just continuous because there are no continuous representations of uh, G, GC in GLN of the algebraic closure of K if K is uh, <coughs> non Archimedean. If K is Archimedean, continuous representation is necessarily algebraic, that is the statement. Okay. <coughs> so, this is the let me recall that, yeah, uh, I have made this condition that rho gamma is uh, semi simple. In general, what could, <coughs> what happens is this if rho gamma is not semi simple, it turns out that you can actually say that uh, this Zersky closure of rho gamma has the identity component is necessarily semi simple, that would be a consequence of this there. What happens is this, if you have, uh, <coughs> uh, how do I say this, see, mm. see, mm. yeah, mm. what happens? So, take an arbitrary representation, then I can always write it say of the series, right? I can filter it such that every successive quotient is uh, <coughs> the representation is irreducible, okay. Irreducible representations we know extend <coughs> and if I look at, uh, so the whole, if I look at Zelsky closure of, uh, so let me start with rho such that rho is any representation. Then I look at rho g, rho gamma, 
Zelsky quotient, let's call this, call this H. H of course breaks up into some reductive group R times unipotent radical reductive group, let me call it S times R U H. Breaks up like this. And therefore, if you look at the associated, uh, the filtration will correspond to uh, R U H acting trivially at every successive quotient. Okay. Get, and once R U H acts trivially, the representation is going to be completely reduced. So, when if you make R U H act, so <coughs> I'm a little confused. Anyway, you do it by some kind of induction. The only thing is you have to make sure is that uh, <coughs> the trivial representation will not occur in the uh, Jordan series. Trivial representation occur, does not occur in the Jordan series because of the following reason. If you take a one dimensional representation that is a home of, of gamma into C star okay, or K star, gamma into, gamma into K star. But it is true that uh, under the hypothesis made, uh, oh, 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 I forgot another crucial condition, sorry, you all, G gamma, huh. assume that real rank G is greater than equal to 2, I forgot. This all important condition. <clears throat> if this whole once the real rank, it's known that gamma is the competent quotient of gamma is finite. That's theorem of Kajdan combined with something of Margulis. Because Kajdan covers the case when there's one factor which is rank greater than to two. But if all factors are rank one, still it is true that is Margulis. The first bit number is zero. So the condition that uh, if rho gamma the image is reductive, it's automatically semi-simple because other, other group is going to be trivial. The abelian part is going to be trivial, <coughs> and then it's um, yeah right. See the point is uh, it's. Uh, I'm a little confused now. What to do with the and then it's a matter of proving that uh, <coughs> I'm getting a bit confused. There's little more work to be done. You see, this only proves that uh, this proves this this H is the statement about bit number proves that H is semi simple. I mean, S is semi simple, S is no wrong, it is not, there is no direct part. But um, how do I handle general case? What happens is that uh, you have to prove that if you have an extension of a completely reducible module by another completely reducible module. It's split. Okay, it's, uh, I don't quite remember how the proof goes. I used to know, but now I forgot. So it's a, it's a co consequence that uh, all representations are completely reducible. All representations. Are, it's a consequence that all representations of gamma are completely reducible. So, I, but I don't remember the proof now. Every representation of gamma. On a finite dimensional complex vector space is completely reducible. Is true. <coughs> so, what one wants to say is that. Uh, the rho gamma closure is automatically 
semi simple it's automatically reductive actually more saturation semi simple for any row rho gamma is semi simple so i don't recall the proof of this i'll leave it at that anyway so i am going to say something about this 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 is what i want to prove and what i will do is to first give a broad outline of what the various steps are the proof and then those steps i'll try to take care of in the next lecture okay so and let me recall the this is usually called super rigidity because there is something called strong rigidity which is due to mosto strong rigidity makes this following statement he proved it for uh, actually strong rigidity was proved by mosto general what he assumed was that if you have gamma in g g simple real simple i mean you can formulate it simple simple also but ultimately we do sit in this situation g sim simple <coughs> gamma in g uh, yeah uh, gamma prime in g prime g g prime both real simple gamma gamma prime lattices then any isomorphism phi from gamma to gamma prime extends uh, g g prime yeah uh, extends g real let me real simple in adjoint groups then uh, is some phi gamma gamma prime extends to an isomorphism of g on g prime but just yes, just yes, much stronger gamma prime has to be in the lattice already in our situation i took any representation notice that if g has rank greater than 2 most of the rigidity is a special case of margulo rigidity if g is of rank greater than 2 because g prime can be anything the consequence the image that get closer the image will be the g prime in gl g prime can be assumed to be contained in some gln and then you have this homomorphism which takes the zelsky closure and the homomorphism obviously extends from g to the zelsky closure and this will follow immediately in the case when rank is going to be but yeah in the mass of theorem is true if uh, g not isomorphic to psl2 that's a crucial condition if g is not as about to psl2 then mass of theorem holds <clears throat> in other words this is equal to saying uh, uh, compact manifolds of uh, For, for as a special case, compact manifolds of constant negative curvature are completely determined up to isometry by the fundamental group. That's, that's what this assertion is. And the method of proof of Mosto is the following: He went to the symmetric space G mod K. In fact, initially he assumed that. You, you see, if you have a mapping of G to G prime, then you can. Easily make, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. G mod K is the the first instance we considered uh, this case of uh, concept of G equals S O O N one modulo center, and then G mod K is the unit disk. And what you disk you, you first construct a map from the disk. You assume that G prime is also assume both of them are the same. and then you had a mapping of the disk to disk compatible with gamma any isometry the d mod gamma and d prime mod gamma prime are both so called k pi 1 spaces so any mapping of the fundamental group induces a corresponding mapping of this so you got a mapping of d to d prime compatible with gamma gamma equivalent map and he shows that it extends to the boundary of the disk on which the group operates on the disk as well as on the boundary it extends to the, this mapping Extends as a gamma equivalent map of the disk for the of the circle of the boundary of the disk from the sphere to sphere, and that mapping he shows is conformal. 
if the uh, if the dimension is greater than, greater than two, the dimension of disk is greater than two, mapping is conformal, and therefore, it one well, the conformal maps of the boundary are precisely the isometries in, in the interior. So two things are the same. So that's how he proves it. So in some sense, the main thing is to extend to the boundary, and that idea is also used by Margulis. Except in, in the most of case, he actually shows that the extension is continuous in the first place, and uses the fact that rank greater than equal to two conclude that it is actually a diffeomorphism, and once it's a diffeomorphism, you can show that it's necessarily quasi-conforming. It's necessarily conform. Conform. That's the way he goes about. <clears throat> and that once you prove the mapping is uh, smooth, then it's quasi that is easy. It's easy to prove it's, uh, it's necessarily conformal. But the point is to prove it's uh, smooth map. And smoothness is the thing which fails when the dimension is two. You can't uh, extend it smoothly, but in dimension greater than two, you can extend it smoothly. Okay, now how does Margulis go about giving his proof? The first proof that Margulis gave depends on a theorem of orthodox and later and work only in the case when G mod gamma is compact. Let me G mod gamma, let me take the case when G mod gamma is compact. So, fix a uh, omega in G relatively compact such that omega gamma equals you can even assume that uh, omega is only a measurable set you can assume that it is actually omega maps 1 1 onto G mod gamma. Assume all this, which means which means you really have a measurable map this way. This is the bijection, so I can invert it. It's a measurable bijection, so I can invert it, I get a measurable map like this. Now I define a suppose S in G is a semi simple element with all eigenvalues of add S real and greater than 0. There is such an element S because we are assuming rank if the G is non compact. It is always going to be the case, G non compact. At this point, I make no assumption on the rank, just G is could can also be rank 1. I will assume, however, the lattice is irreducible. If there are compact factors, the projections, <coughs> projections of gamma are dense on those compact factors. If it is rank 1, there will be only one non compact factor. And the, all other factors will be compact, but the lattice is irreducible, so projections are dense. Then what he does is the following: you have, uh, <coughs> yeah. You see, <coughs> you are given a representation rho of gamma in GLN. Okay. Now. Look at G mod gamma and look at also this G cross, this acts on Kn and make gamma act diagonally on this. That is, you look at Gv, gamma will be by definition G gamma 
Lu gak main bus Bi Harga main kan This is essentially construction of the associated Local system or vector bundle Depending on the topology you put on K This is a vector bundle Except now It's only measurable You can't say anything Because if Rho is a representation One doesn't I mean it will be a Good vector bundle if K is real or complex, if K is a local field, it's simply some kind of measurable bundle with fibers being vector spaces over local field. That's the kind of thing. And obviously, this, this is a natural map of G mod gamma, the fibers being K. Okay, now the semi-simple element S, gamma acts on the right, take the left action of the semi-simple element. That's compatible with the gamma action. So get action of S only on the first factor. Action of S on the first factor gives you action on G cross K by gamma. Which preserves the structure on the fibers. On each fiber, it's a vector space for morphs. This is a standard thing which you do usually with vector bundles on real and so on, but I'm just putting in K and sort of arbitrary local field instead of the real or complex vector field. You get this. <coughs> and then this context, so S is a measure preserving map of G mod gamma to itself. And what you have, and what you have is a lift of that pressure preserving map into a bundle homomorphism of the total space G cross <coughs> The theorem of oscillates tells you in this context. I am not stating the theorem, but consequence of Oswald's theorem in this context is the following. There is <coughs> a Q greater than 0, 0 less than Q less than n <coughs> sorry I have to say if rho gamma closure is non compact there is a Q greater than 0 0 less than Q less than n and a measurable map F from G <coughs> to G and Q, the Grassmannian of Q planes in N space satisfying the following conditions. F of G P equals F G for every P in P a minimal parabolic. And two F of oh I put the gamma action on the Okay, so let me put f of p g and f of g gamma is rho gamma inverse f g <coughs> for every gamma. In other words, the Grassmann, of course, is, is a compact space, and I'm going 
what I say is this map f actually factors through g mod p. It's a map of g mod p to the Grassmannian. Grassmannian is some kind of GLN modulo parabolic group. And here I am taking g modulo minimal parabolic group into the Grassmannian you have a mapping which is compatible with the action of gamma on the two sides. So it is factors through g mod p and on g mod p also gamma operates and left action of p is what I am taking gamma acts on the right on g mod p also gamma acts. So it is a mapping of g mod p into the Grassmannian which is compatible with the action of the discrete group gamma. There is such a measurable map. This is a consequence of it. It is an ergodic theory theorem due to oscillates. The theorem is in some sense a generalization of the so called Birkhoff ergodic theorem, a non commutative version of the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. <coughs> this is uh, originally uh, Margulis proved this statement for G mod gamma compact. For G mod gamma non compact, also the same statement holds, and this was first pointed out by Furstenberg. If it has finite measure, you can still do that. So, same oscillator theorem modulo or for G mod gamma, if G mod gamma is compact, oscillator theorem implies the statement. Even if G mod gamma has finite measure non compact, then the same above statement holds was essentially due to Furstenberg. Actually, Margulis had proved the superiority theorem for the case of uh, non compact quotient also. Actually, a specific case when G mod gamma is non compact, we had a different way approach to prove the super rigidity. And that, uh, that approach <coughs> works, this, this, this uh, still super, but if you, this statement does not require any condition of the rank. The super rigidity requires the condition that the rank is greater than 1. This statement requires you no, know, the thing is, you always get a measurable map like this. And in the case when the rank is greater than equal to 2, you can show that the measurable map is actually the algebraic morphism of the corresponding G mod P to the Grassmannian. Of course, in particular, the Grassmannian has to be over real or complex numbers. So, his statement is that if the measurable map is always available, but when the rank is greater than 2, the measurable map is actually like a, a holomorphic map, an algebraic map. That is the kind of step. <coughs> okay, now, yeah. <coughs> so let me make that other statement. Call it a separate theorem. So, this is one theorem. The second theorem is uh, G of rank greater than equal to 2, comma irreducible lattice row representation of gamma. J L N K <coughs> then if and f the measurable map of G to Grassmannian of uh, Hughes Q subspaces in n dimensional space, F measurable map such that uh, 
f of p g equals f g for p and p a minimal parabolic g and to f of g gamma equals rho gamma inverse f g for every gamma and gamma <coughs> then f is necessarily a morphism of g mod p into the Grassmannian. In particular, it implies k equals r or c. Any map is necessarily if the important condition is g of rank reasonable to and gamma is the most. Here, uh, the hypothesis that uh, such an f exists has been for two conditions, right? And the conclusion is it must have been necessarily morphous. That's right. <coughs> yeah, both these uh, results involve uh, methodistic arguments. What I will do today is now to tell you how the arithmetic theorem follows from this superiority theorem. So, super rigidity implies arithmeticity. What does recall that gamma is arithmetic? If there exists a number field. K and an algebraic group H or K, <coughs> semi simple algebraic group H or K and a projection H K tensor R or Q to G with compact kernel and co kernel. And with f of h, well, I have to be, yeah, okay. H is assumed to be linear algebra group, so it's a subgroup of GLN. So h okay makes sense, integral points of h is going to make sense. f h okay is commensurable. with that is the definition of the group being arithmetic. See the point because in principle our G may be may have compact factors okay. and then you can throw out compact factors or add compact factors 
because of that you will have to make the definition like this. This is a projection from the simple, simple algebraic group. If it is a something defined over some number field and then this HK tensor R will break up, K tensor R itself will break up into number of uh, real and complex fields. And so you will get various complex or real league groups corresponding to them, but all of them are real league groups. So it is real points of a certain algebraic group if you like. That is mapped onto G or not quite onto, it goes into a subgroup of G which is uh, co-compact, whose quotient is compact, it becomes a normal subgroup here whose quotient is compact. That is what I want. The kernel and co-kernel of this are both compact. I mean, so in particular, I am going to assume that uh, image f is normal in G. I should have said that f h tensor h of k tens r over q normal in G. Only then I can talk of the co kernel, that is the reason I. This is what I want. <clears throat> now, how do I deduce this from the super rigidity? Of course, like this. Firstly, <clears throat> okay, gamma is finitely generated. This is a well known fact, it is a theorem of, in fact, Kasdan proved it in the case when G has rank greater than equal to 2 and when it is rank 1, some Margulis, if, you know, the question is if there is even one rank 2 factor, then Kasdan proved this, this statement. Yes, no rank 1 factors, sorry, if there is no rank 1 factors, then it is due to Kasdan. If all factors of are of rank less than to one, this comes out of uh, <coughs> it comes out of uh, theorem of mind with Garland. In the, you can construct the fundamental domain as you can do with the arithmetic groups, so it comes out to that or there is also another alternate method, but anyway, so this is Kajda, uh, this is one constructs a fundamental domain, if the quotient is compact there is nothing to prove, compact manifolds are fundamental, uh, uh, finally generated fundamental groups. In fact, even Gamma finite represented will follow from this and such. Anyway, gamma is finite represented, <coughs> which means you can assume that gamma is, con is contained in the, I mean, gamma is in GLN of F, where F is a finite generated field over Q. Could be transcendental, possible, but finally then it field over Q. So all that you have to make sure that you take the entries of the finite number of matrices, they will you take the field generated by them over Q, and all other matrices coming from gamma are going to be products of those matrices. So you are right. <coughs> okay, now let's look at what happens. So G. I am going to assume is, you, you can look at the adjoint representation. I am assuming that uh, replace G by G modulus the center. It makes no, no big difference because, you know, but the extension of the lattice is only from a simply connected group. The extension of the homomorphism is only to the simply connected group, but gamma can, you can take the, what can you, what you can do is just look at G to, G modulo the center, 
It's a finite group. And by passing the subgroup of finite induction gamma, you can assume it's torsion free. So it will be inje map injected into that. So gamma is a subgroup of both G as well as G modulo the center, which is why you can, to prove this statement, you can assume that gamma is actually contained in G modulo the center. After all, we have to go to a subgroup of finite index in any case. So gamma is contained in G modulo the center. And G modulo the center, so can assume that G as trivial center, which means G is actually contained in GL of the Lie algebra. You have the adjoint representation, it is faithful here. <coughs> now, it is uh, actually contained as we know is this let us GL, uh, G is a vector space. I choose a suitable basis, make it some GLN and then some finite field and some, some finite generated field. I can assume it goes into this, this size. Yani is the dimension of the algebra, then it gets to GLNR. Actually, it factors through some GLNF, where F is some finite generated subfield of R. The adjoint representation of gamma goes into, sorry. Gamma goes into GLNF, sorry, not G. Contained in R. Contained in R. It has to be. I mean, uh, gamma, every entry, of every matrix, uh, gamma is an element of, under, under add, okay. it goes into real matrix. So, it is subfield of real numbers, finally, then that subfield of real numbers. <coughs> now, of course, uh, this whole, both these are contained in GLN. Now, look at the, suppose sigma is an element of automorphisms <coughs> of C over F. You have this mapping gamma, the adjoint map add here goes into GLN C, goes into GLN R, therefore GLN C. Apply it sigma here. Now, if sigma, so look at sigma composed with that gamma. If this is not compact, then the mapping extends to a home of G into G. So, sigma composed with that, if sigma composed with that has non compact closure. Then it extends to a morphism of G in GLNC. The, this original inclusion is add, so I will call this sigma twisted. Put the sigma on the left. This is a morphism. You can get such a morphism. Okay, now. <clears throat>
<clears throat> Let's Let me consider the following. So you have this what C by F and let me consider the subset automorphism to C over F with the property that tau restricted to gamma extends to a morphism. Add composite to pro composite tag. Pro composite tag makes only sense for yeah. Pro composite tag restricted to gamma extends to morphism of G in G and then you get a subset to Maybe I call this group script G and this subset I'll call G sub zero. Maybe Sorry? By what you just now said, is, is it not the whole of G? Everything extends. No, it's the image has to be non compact. Ah, yes, yes. Image closed has to be non compact. Sure. So maybe I will call this G prime and let me call G naught the set of two such that hot C in sorry, two in C over F with the property that two composed with that does not extend or equivalently to composed with that of gamma is relatively compact. Okay. Now, this gets a bit Oh, before this, maybe I should let that. I mean, keep this in mind. But let me say something else, which I should first have said earlier. That is, <clears throat> if you look at gamma, one knows as gamma is Zariski dense. G. G as in a struct, some structure of an algebra group, it is always Zersky dense in G. Now, the point is if look at let K be the field generated by, they call K something else earlier. No, I called it F, okay. K be the field generated by trace at gamma as gamma varies over gamma. Okay. This is a subfield of R in any case. <clears throat> the 
uh, treating the STL element, okay. <coughs> Therefore, of C if you like, makes no difference. Trace divide gamma, gamma. Then what I want to say is the point. Then the statement is that then G has a definition as an algebraic group over K. with gamma contained in G k. This is seen as follows. You look at the algebra generated by in the coordinate ring of C g, consider the Algebra generated by elements F in C G <coughs> this you must think of as uh, <coughs> yeah let me yeah F in C G such that uh, F of F gamma is completely contained in K. Look at this. <coughs> Consider algebra generated by these things. This is a clearly we know that <coughs> see gamma in, in G is contained in G of uh, Let me turn it around a little bit. Sorry. Yeah. Look at the in. Sorry. Let me relax. In CG, the coordinate ring. Consider the function, the trace function. Trace is the adjoint representation. That is, tra G going to trace at G. G acts on C G by reduction to the action. G acts on C G by left regular action. Okay. Inside this we have this function trace at G, which is let me call this uh, lambda of G. And look at consider the translates of lambda by elements of gamma. All these translates on gamma take values in the field generated k because you are going to trace gamma gamma prime, is how you are going to fix a gamma prime when you are going to look at trace gamma prime gamma as gamma varies. So, as gamma varies it always takes values in k. So, these functions consider translates and their and their k linear span. The, all these functions take values on gamma take values in k. It is translation invariant <coughs> and if I look at the algebra generated over k, again all these functions take values in k. There is no. So, the algebra generated taking all the translation and take the algebra generated you get a subalgebra of C g defined over k and since gamma is Zersky dense in g, this subalgebra when you go, go so you tensor with c becomes whole algebra. Get consider subalgebra generated by this
these functions call that subalgebra which you call kg subalgebra which I call kg and it is easy to see because of the Zatsky density of gamma and g you see that kg tensor c over k is cg which means g acquires a definition over k g acquires a definition so g def acquires a definition over k not only that and gamma is contained in gk so in fact the final generated field I was talking about I can assume is k this f I look at the entries of gamma all of them are already in gk I know so I can simply take that to be f so f equals can take f equal to k <coughs> and what one does is to say you look at I said you take automorphisms of C over K firstly one shows that K this this uh, <coughs> you have automorphism C over sorry you take yeah take automorphism yeah take automorphism of C over Q you can work do all this with C over Q okay. <coughs> and then one shows that you take all automorphisms of C over Q whatever I said here instead of saying I think you have com sigma composite sigma I took in automorphisms of C over K but you can do everything over C over Q okay of course it shifts K into something else it does not matter but the important thing is if the image is non-compact the extension uh, representation extends that is the important thing and what you do next is you show that uh, k is necessarily a finite extension of q I come to that and this, uh, this requires little bit of work first you show that c is uh, k is necessarily a finite extension of q and then <coughs> you look at automorphisms of c over k which is essentially same as automorphism of k bar over k basically I mean since you are fixing if you look at automorphism of k bar over k that is the Galois group of q bar over k then every one of them either the image is compact or extends when the, when the image is compact the group g it is Zelsky dense so the closure will be Zelsky dense and the compact and therefore it's automatically the whole algebraic group. So the G goes into a compact group for every automorphism for which sigma k is relatively compact. G itself, the, the extended, I mean, the corresponding group G itself is compact. So what happens is this: basically, gamma gets for every sigma, it either goes into the goes into group G sigma. You call it it is either compact or you have an extension of <coughs> how do I say g sigma non compact and all that happens is in the entries of gamma are simply shifted by sigma and that is exactly what happens when you have a arithmetic group it goes in so at the, all the archimedean places you have argue like this now in the non archimedean places there is going to be no morphism no that means it goes into a compact group so it go into integers you know what are the compact subgroups of gln they are all of the form gln of o of and o is the number field i mean o is the maximum compact subring of k if k is a local field you have a maximum compact subring and all maximum compacts are some gln so in every periodic field it will go into a comp gamma goes into a compact group that means the entries of gamma are integers periodic integers for every p so gamma is integral 
that's how you prove its arithmetic okay so this is how super rigidity implies arithmetic i have not explained it too well but i'm going to stop here because <coughs> my throat is giving me trouble next time i'll fill out the gap here and try to say something about the proof of the other two theorems i stated okay. <laughs>